Thanks for the introduction. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Cool. Uh, yeah, so I'll be uh, talking about broadcast and trace with short surface exercise. This is joint work with uh, Richard Goyo, Brent Waters, and Daniel Wicks. So first, let me tell you about what broadcast and trace is. And in a nutshell, broadcast and trace combines two different primitives that are broadcast encryption and total tracing in such a way that the combined protocol is uh, more powerful than taking the two primitive individually. So in more detail, the, let me review what trader tracing and broadcast encryption are. So in a trader tracing scheme, you have, uh, it's a public key encryption scheme where there are many uh, potential receiving, uh, receivers, with each with individual keys. And the main feature is that you, um, there's a way to trace colliding users. So what does that mean? Here, suppose that Alice and Bob produce a decoding box that can uh, decrypt the message or infer any meaningful information about the message then you want there to be a tracing procedure that identifies at least one trader that participated in decoding this box. In a broadcast, uh, broadcast encryption scheme, uh, it uh, has somewhat the same syntax in the sense that there are many users, each with respective keys. Uh, but now, what you, uh, the functionality provides a way to target a specific subset of users. So say when I encrypt, I provide this, for instance, subset, uh, subset S as a part of the encryption, and only Bob and Carol will be uh, authorized to decrypt. And in particular, Alice won't have any meaningful, uh, won't be able to infer any meaningful information about the message. So similarly, for instance, if the target set of uh, receiving users is, uh, is this, then neither Alice or Bob are authorized, and security um, requires that even if they collude, uh, and by co combining the information of the secret keys, they won't be able to uh, infer any meaningful information about the message. Okay, so what's broadcast and trace? Well, uh, it's a way to combine both. So um, in particular, it's a broadcast encryption scheme. So whenever you are encrypting a message, you can target a specific set of users. And similar to trader tracing, uh, if authorized users are producing decoding boxes, then there should be a meaningful way to trace uh, uh, traders. But the way uh, that broadcast and trace is really meaningful and in particular uh, more powerful than just having uh, broadcast encryption and trader tracing side by side is by um, uh, having some, uh, some, property, uh, some security property whenever authorized users collude with unauthorized user. So in particular, if you would uh, simply use broadcast, and, um, trace, uh, broadcast encryption and trader tracing side by side, one thing that could happen uh, by using a tracing algorithm would be to, uh, to trace a non-authorized user, which is really weird because intuitively uh, Alice here shouldn't have any, uh, key shouldn't have any power to infer any uh, information about the message. So what we require instead uh, is that uh, the tracing algorithm should trace authorized traders. And that's really what makes the, the primitive uh, much more interesting and harder to build. Okay, so let me review a bit of, um, of previous work. So there was a lot of progress in terms of, uh, yeah, sorry, sorry. So the main quantity will be look at to uh, judge the quality of a, of a scheme will be the scalability in the, term, uh, in the number of users. So suppose there's many, many, many users, you want the ciphertext size to be as short as possible. That will be our main quantity uh, uh, for comparison. So it turns out that we have uh, many different uh, primitives from many different assumptions. And from standard assumptions, so I'll uh, forget about IO or witness encryption, uh, in, uh, essentially what we have is uh, essentially optimal broadcast encryption from pairings and optimal um, traitor tracing from LWE. But it turns out that since more than 10 years ago, um, the, the best broadcast and trace uh, scheme that we have uh, only ha uh, have ciphertext that scale with square root of n. So if n is big, this is still pretty large. So what we do in this paper is we give a construction of a broadcast and trace scheme with short ciphertext size. So for uh, arbitrarily constant, fixed constant epsilon, the ciphertext size will only scale as n to the epsilon. And the assumptions that we make are both learning with errors and some binary types uh, assumptions. So it particularly needs both. As a, um, as a drawback, our uh, tracing procedure needs a master secret key in order to trace uh, authorized uh, traders. 
but uh, this is inherited by, by pretty much all optimal traitor tracing schemes that we have under standard assumptions. Um, so for the rest of the talk, I'll be uh, telling about how to build broadcast and trace with short cipher text. And to do so, I will uh, talk a bit about how we get actually get optimal traitor tracing from uh, LWE and how to mirror every step in order to carefully add broadcast. Okay, so how do we build uh, broadcast, uh, uh, sorry, uh, how do we build uh, traitor tracing from uh, LWE? Um, very um, cute recipe to do that is to use what we call private linear broadcast encryption that was introduced by Bonessa and others. Uh, so I will call that PLB for short. And the idea is really to, uh, so you start with a scheme where everybody can decrypt, and the idea will be to disable the users one by one. So what does that mean? You'll have a special type of encryption that I will call for, for this talk a, a trace encryption, where you additionally impose a threshold index. And the main idea is that the user keys with index uh, less than the threshold won't be able to decrypt. So the first property you want is that this trace encryption, whenever the threshold authorizes all the users to be indistinguishable from a standard encryption. And then when you raise the threshold, uh, you, uh, you little by little, you disable all the keys. And in particular, in the end, uh, no key should be, uh, should be um, working in some sense. So here, the um, encryption should hide all information about the message. So the last property we want is some kind of privacy of uh, this threshold. So as an, uh, as, an, uh, as an example, if the threshold varies from two to, uh, two to three, of course, Bob can tell the difference because in one case, his uh, key works and not in the second. But what we want is that Bob should be the only, way, uh, only uh, person who, uh, who is able to, uh, to tell the difference. Okay, so how do we build uh, traitor tracing from such a primitive? So suppose we have a decoding box that allows to infer meaningful information about the message. Well, first we'll switch to this tracing, um, this tracing mode. And in particular, this will be indistinguishable from the edge of the decoder, so the decoder will still work with this new uh, ciphertext. But we know that if we uh, increase the threshold all the way, uh, all the way down, then the de uh, decoder shouldn't work because the, um, there's no information anymore about the message here. So what happens is that there has to be some index starting on which the decoder stops working in some sense. So what happens is that there's some index such that the decoder works here, but suddenly it kind of stops working here. And because of our privacy property over there, the only way the decoder could have meaningful, um, uh, different uh, meaningfully different behavior between those two is if the secret key uh, two was uh, used to produce the decoder box. So in particular, that means that this index corresponds to a trader and we can flag this uh, user as a trader. Okay, so how do we uh, add broadcast into that? We'll use a very uh, similar idea where we'll disable users one by one but now we want to only trace authorized user. So the natural thing to do is to only disable authorized users one by one. So what happens is similar as before, now uh, you trace, uh, sorry, you, you start with a broadcast encryption scheme, and now you'll add a threshold that will additionally disable users. So in particular, even in the beginning, Alice is disabled because she's not in the authorized set, and when you increase the threshold, well, in the end, the message should be uh, completely hidden. So the only thing that changes is the privacy property uh, we mentioned before. Uh, in particular, for instance, if I increase the threshold from one to, uh, to two, what we want is that the, the key from Alice shouldn't be uh, helping distinguish. In some sense, if she's not uh, able to, uh, to decrypt the message in the first place, her key shouldn't help, um, well, if I, any, uh, if I any meaningful information about the treasure either. So instead, what we want is that when we increase the threshold here, the only keys that allow to uh, tell the difference between two different indices are the ones that are authorized. Okay? And similarly as before, now uh, if we have a decoder, uh, decoding box, 
We can set the threshold to uh, include all the authorized users, disable them one by one, and the same argument as before um, simply uh, states that the user that will trace will be now in the, uh, in the authorized set. So that gives a general recipe for broadcast and trace. So let me now get back to uh, trace tracing, so without broadcast, and how do we build such a scheme? So the first step um, is to add attribute-based encryption. So if you were at the, um, at the base paper uh, talk from Rodem, you know that like, in an attribute-based encryption scheme, there's uh, secret keys uh, with respect to, uh, to policies and encryption with respect to attributes. And the only, um, the only way um, the keys can uh, decrypt uh, the, some ciphertext is if, say, the attributes decrypt to one. So what it does is simply uh, shifts uh, all the message data review, uh, delivery part towards the ABE. And now what we are left to do is simply uh, define this policy that uh, states whether users are authorized to decrypt or not. Uh, okay, so if in a private linear broadcast encryption, users decrypt to either uh, nothing or the message with some privacy property over there, then uh, in a mixed functional encryption scheme, uh, the only thing we need to do is to, uh, to, um, uh, to decrypt to a Boolean that states whether users are authorized or not. So in particular, in the standard encryption in the, um, in the bottom, all the keys will uh, decrypt to one. So a more convenient, actually a more convenient way to, uh, to see that would be that the mixed FE would be used to disable traders. I will get back to that later. Okay, so how do we build uh, such, a, such a mixed FE? And the main tool that we we'll use are private constraint PRFs that will, uh, that will in short be um, PCPRFs. And what are PCPRFs? Those are uh, pseudo-random functions that can additionally be constrained. So if you have a predicate that takes uh, as input, an input to the PRF, then you get a new key such that the predicate defines when, uh, whether you are allowed to compute the original PRF or not. So a, uh, say if the predicate evaluates to zero, then you are about to compute the original PRF value. But if the, um, if the predicate evaluates to one, then the original value of the PRF um, remains pseudo-random even given the key. Okay, so um, an additional property that we use uh, is that the constraint should be private in the sense that given um, two keys, well, of course, the two keys won't evaluate uh, the same way on the point where the predicates differ. And the privacy property that we want is that this should actually be the only way you can tell uh, the true, uh, true constraint keys apart. Okay, so how do we build, um, yeah, and you, uh, we get a private constraint PRFs from LW, pretty much. Oh yeah, so how do we build a uh, mixed effort from uh, private constraint PRFs? Uh, the idea will be to give to every user an evaluation of the PRF on their index. And then, to decrypt, we'll check whether this, uh, the, the value they get is the same as the evaluation of a constraint key over their index. So more pictorially, what happens, for, for instance, for the standard encryption scheme that we want to always decrypt to one, um, if we take a PRF, uh, con um, sorry, a constraint PRF that is constrained everywhere, then this, uh, those two values will be uh, different with hyper and that will always decrypt to one. But more generally, if you add a threshold, you'll have a key and encryption uh, that kind of uh, uh, allows to compute the original value above the threshold and not under. In particular, uh, here, Alice will be able to compute the right value, so she will decrypt to zero, and the other users for the other users, the original PR value is to the random, so that will decrypt to one. Okay, so uh, in particular, the privacy uh, uh, property of the, uh, uh, of the PCPRF exactly tells that the only way to tell the difference between two consecutive thresholds uh, is to have the PR value of tr um, corresponding to, uh, um, uh, to somewhere where the predicate differs, and that's exactly what we want for the, um, for the mixed FE scheme. Okay, so how do we add broadcasting to all of that? So the first insight 
is that if we have an attribute-based encryption that is strong enough, we can defer all the broadcast functionality into the, into the uh, ABE. So now, the, um, uh, the ABE will also test whether the users are authorized and will only uh, deliver the message in that case. But still, we are not done. And the main uh, property of the broadcast uh, that we want still have to be inferred by, the, by some kind of mixed FE that, uh, that we still have to implement. So again, if we start with the augmented broadcast encryption over there, uh, where, the, um, uh, where the, mes uh, uh, the decryption over some keys evaluate to either bottom or the message, uh, so say here with a threshold it disables this user, what we want from broadcast mixed FE is a slightly different syntactically. So in particular, in the standard encryption, all the keys will decrypt to one, And um, we slightly change the decryption property so that um, unauthorized users will always decrypt to one. So that's slightly uh, different uh, syntactically. But what we really want is that the only way, always, that you can tell the difference between a, um, between, um, um, a, a mixed of encryption that allows everybody, in some sense, to one that disables everybody is to um, have the key for someone who is in the, in the authorized set. Okay, so how do we build that? And the insight will be to, well, uh, we'll follow a similar pattern as before. Uh, and now, uh, so, so we um, first want to ensure that for users that, in, uh, that are not in the authorized set, they should always decrypt to one. So how do we do that? Uh, the main idea is to make the checked value uh, that we have um, kind of unpredictable even given all of the keys. So how do we do that? Uh, the idea would be to have many different pair of keys and to have some value, uh, to use in this check some value that remains pseudo-random even given all the keys. So if we sum over um, if the, the check value is this one, then in particular it, cons, uh, it con, uh, contains uh, a value like that. So um, I'll, uh, I'll explain with the picture later. And in particular, the value will be pseudo random. So in particular, for every user, so, so there's like as many keys as, as there are users, and users will get evaluations on their index only for different keys. So what happens is that in the sum, you'll use some. Um, uh, some uh, value that nobody has, and that will make the checks to the random, and that will make the decryption output one. Okay, so th that's, uh, that works for us, but there's still a syntactic problem. In particular, it's not clear at all how to even evaluate this. In particular, before, what you had is, um, was the encryption was a, a, a constraint key, but now you don't want to give all the constraint key individually, because otherwise the argument of this being pseudo random wouldn't hold. <clears throat> so the idea is to use some additional property of the PCFRF that's called key homomorphism. So what's this property? It states that to compute a sum over different keys of pair values, there's two ways to do it. Either you can simply compute the sum of the, of the outputs, or you can uh, perform some uh, homomorphic operation over the keys and then evaluate the PRF. And what this, uh, this allows us to do is to, um, uh, to take a similar sum as before over the constraint keys, uh, and that will, uh, that will uh, finish the construction. Okay, so uh, what we get overall is a broadcast and trace encryption starting from attribute-based encryption <coughs> and broadcast mixed FE. And I roughly showed how to um, build a broadcast mixed FE scheme uh, starting from key homomorphic private concern PRFs, and those we can also build from LW. Okay, but uh, still, I didn't talk about uh, efficiency at all, so what's going on here? Well, in the end, what, uh, in, the, in the final scheme, uh, the ciphertext will pre pretty much be an, uh, an AB ciphertext. And it turns out that ABs with ciphertext, well, we have from binary maps. So in some sense, um, the AB will also provide the broadcast, uh, broadcast part, and that's uh, why, in some sense, the broadcast functionality comes from the bilinear part, in some sense. Uh, but that's, um, there's still a problem in the sense that 
ADs from Balenoir maps only support kind of weak kind of families of policies, small, uh, small family of policies. And partially, for we know, like, uh, all the, those uh, AB schemes only support policies in NC1. And recall that here, the policy that dictates whether users are authorized to uh, decrypt or not uh, is uh, given by this uh, broadcast mixed feed decryption. So jumping back, uh, back to the construction, this uh, broadcast mixed uh, uh, decryption was a private, uh, uh, private concern, uh, concern PRF evaluation. So it turns out that if you look under the hood, this uh, is done using uh, roughly uh, log and multiplication, so this is not known to be an one as is. So the final ingredient that we have is to pre-compute blocks, uh, blocks of matrices so that in the end, to evaluate, you only need to multiply a constant number of matrices, and that you can do in NC1. In particular, the, uh, the encryption part uh, will consist of many uh, of n to the epsilon uh, matrices over there. Cool. Uh, so um, as open questions, I sh uh, we showed how to, um, to build broadcast and trace with n to the epsilon self size. It's a really natural question to, uh, uh, to ask whether this could be brought down towards a polylog, as uh, well, uh, that would, be, uh, that would close, uh, match more closely what we have to uh, under, say, I.O. And roughly, what, what I also showed before is that this could follow from uh, two, uh, two different orthogonal kind of uh, progresses, either from uh, to have stronger ABs, uh, succinct IBs, or even uh, or alternatively have uh, PRFs with um, a more efficient uh, evaluation. Unless uh, we could ask to have slightly milder standard assumptions uh, in our constructions. Uh, so that's it uh, for me. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Right. Thank you. Are there any questions? So I was wondering, um, if I got it correctly, the trader tracing gives you uh, the guarantee that you will get one of the authorized traders. Yep. Is there any known results regarding getting all the traders that combine the uh, decryption box? Or? Well, so for traders, uh, trader tracing is not clear, but at least something that you can do with broadcast and trace is, um, say, flag a trader, and then if the decoding box still works over the so authorized set where you remove the trader, then you can still, uh, uh, still trace and like, remove more traders one at, the, one at a time. So that's like, not something you can do generically with trader tracing, but that's also something that is really interesting with broadcast and trace. OK, thanks. All right, if there are no further questions, let's thank Billy again. <laughs>